Hello, this is Leon Barman. <coughs> uh, this is going to be my uh, second attempt at uh, making this video. Uh, so last time it was an hour long teaching. We'll see how long this one goes. We're just going to let the spirit take it. Um, and uh, last time within five minutes of the video the audio cut out. So uh, that will not be our case this time. God willing, <laughs> so uh, and uh, technology willing as well. I uh, kind of went into it. I changed some settings on my webcam to see if it'll uh, take away uh, the disruption of the sound uh, that took place last time. So and I uh, messed with some other things, you know, contrast and brightness and color and so forth. Uh, so if this video looks a little different, um, you know, we'll see what the finished product looks like. Um, I also did not dim my monitor light this time, which, um, so if the glare off my glasses is a problem, then that'll be something we'll address next time, but we're going to see how it plays out this time, okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> this is the first teaching in a series that I'm doing uh, called First Principles, based off of uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 th uh, through chapter 6 and verse 2, which, you know, the, uh, the author of Hebrews says, um, you know, let's go beyond the basics on unto perfection. And uh, he lists off uh, several teachings that uh, constitute uh, basic doctrines. And uh, it's a lesson in and of itself if you want to read that text. I'm not going to read that this time. Um, but what we're teaching on is the last in that list of, of doctrines uh, called eternal judgments. There's a lot of interest in this, and uh, this is very important for us to discuss uh, for our audience. And, you know, the purpose of these first principle teachings is to meet a need in the body of Christ, uh, particularly for new believers themselves who are new to the faith, new coming back to the faith, uh, and they want to learn what the basic doctrines of the church are, and, and um, a lot of things that may be neglected in today's churches uh, as being taught on. Um, so we're going to address that need. And, and also for young ministers out there, you know, you're just starting out. Uh, you, you began a new church. Maybe you have a storefront church going on. Or maybe you started a home, a house church. Home fellowships are really big now. And, um, and, and this will meet a need that, you know, you can feel free any, any of the videos any of the videos really that you wish to to use, uh, but anything that's going to be titled First Principles is going to be a part of this series. Um, and th these may be used to teach uh, uh, groups of new believers and whatnot in Bible studies, uh, in churches and youth groups and so on and so forth. However, you know, the Holy Spirit leads you to do so, but you're more than welcome uh, to, to use these videos for that purpose. Okay, so let's get into our study. Uh, we're going to be discussing today eternal judgments. <clears throat> now, the typical belief out there is that um, that there's <clears throat> you know that everyone lives their life and and. Um, there's going to be one resurrection where all of humanity will be resurrected in mass and face the one judgment where you know God will be sitting on his throne and he'll be separating the good from the bad uh, and the sheep from the goats, the wheat and the tares <clears throat> and and that Everyone has sentence passed on them. Some go to the right, some go to the left, and the ones on the left uh, do not meet a good fate. <laughs> um, and, and, and we view judgments like this. We view biblical judgment like this 
and resurrection. Um, <clears throat> and there's different views on that. Um, but we want to show that in Scripture, there's a lot of different types of judgment. In, in fact, uh, I, I feel led right now just to to open in prayer because I feel that this topic is more important than that it's just important. And, and I just I just want to pray and lead us in prayer right now. So Father in Jesus name, I just invite you and your spirit into this video, God, and that you will, establish your truth and that you will teach us God and that you will guide us into all truth by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your guidance and for your teaching and for your illumination of the scriptures to our understanding, Father. Renew our minds, God, according to the truth. And we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> praise God. Let's proceed. <laughs> There are seven judgments uh, in Scripture that are enumerated. And um, last time I took the time to read through each of the t texts. I don't know if we're going to take the time to do that, but I will provide references for each. And, and I'll get into describing each judgment um, as we go along. Uh, and if we need to go deeper, we will. But there's... <coughs> There's a teaching that Christ did in John chapter 5 and John chapter 12 that, that will take everything that I'm going to say about the seven judgments listed off and is going to take it in, into a totally different realm, into a different level. And it's going to blow our minds because it's so it affects each and every one of us and it's so important. Um, and we're, the only, we're just going to get into it before we get there. So uh, let's go through the seven judgments that are, that are in Scripture. <clears throat> we'll discuss, first of all, the judgment of sin at the cross. You know, that each and every one of our sins were judged at the cross. So that is the first judgment that we wish to discuss. So we see that in John chapter 12. Verses 31 through 32. If you have a pen and paper uh, in hand, that would be good. You could write these references down if you don't want to look them up now. Maybe I'll read them. We'll see. <laughs> we have 1 Peter 3.18. And we have 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. Okay. <clears throat> this one's important. Uh, I mean, they're all important. But I'm going to go ahead and read these references The first reference is out of John chapter 12, and um, this is one of the texts that we're going to return to later, but uh, for right now I'm going to cite this text uh, in reference to our sins being judged at the cross. John chapter 12, verses 31 through 32, Jesus Christ in the shadow of the cross, you know, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Which we know, you know, him being lifted up meant that he was crucified on the cross. He says that in the act of him being put to death on the cross, him being lifted up, that the whole cosmos, the world, was judged at that point. That the prince of this world was cast out and that <clears throat> he will begin to draw all unto him. Okay, so... And this all took place at the cross. Okay, so there's the judgment listed there that the whole cosmos, all of humanity, whoever existed, you know, you know, all, you know, um, 
was judged when he was lifted up from the earth. Okay, let's go on to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. All right. <clears throat> okay. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Okay, so here we see that um, that Christ, when he was suffering on the cross, he was suffering for sins. Now this isn't meant that he suffered. Um, it wasn't that God. It wasn't that God was punishing Jesus on the cross in our place. But it means that his suffering was for our sins. So, so that so that we would know that that we were forgiven, so that we would know that our sins were atoned for, that the just went for the unjust, you know, the innocent for the guilty, you know, Barabbas was let loose, <laughs> and Christ uh, went to the cross in his stead, <laughs> the cross that Barabbas should have been on, the cross that you and I should have been on, Christ was on to atone for our sins. And um, and this was all to bring us to God. This was all to reconcile us to God. So the fact that we are reconciled to God today is because Jesus suffered for us on the cross. <clears throat> so that our sins were judged because the just went for the for the unjust. So it was for our unjustness our unrighteousness, our sin and iniquity that he hung on the cross between heaven and earth. Okay, so that's the first judgment. The second judgment, uh, and we want to state when these judgments took place in time. <clears throat> so the believer's self-judgment <clears throat> is the second uh, judgment we want to discuss this can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 31 through 32. And the context of that is simply, you know, the Lord's table, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, you know, called by various names, but it's a, the sacrament that Christ instituted uh, during the, the Passover in, in which he was betrayed, um, that, you know, he took the bread and break it and said, this is my body. And uh, he took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And uh, in lieu of that, the Apostle Paul was writing believers in the church at Corinth, and he was encouraging them to examine themselves um, uh, before they partook of the Lord's table because some people were treating it like um, an all-you-can-eat buffet, uh, not regarding their poorer brethren, and, and, and they were just, you know, uh, being greedy with the food, you know, kind of being um, gluttonous at these love feasts or at these Eucharistic tables. And uh, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, do you know what you're dealing with here? You know, you're remembering Christ's death. And you're looking forward to his coming again. And so examine yourselves before you partake of uh, the body and blood of the Lord. You know, um, what reminds us of that. And he says, <coughs> examine yourselves. He says, for if you would judge yourselves, you shall not be judged. You know, uh, so if we examine ourselves, you know, as... As the Bible says in the book of Psalms, in thy light shall we see light. You know, and, and there's various scriptures in the Psalms and so forth that says, examine me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. You know, uh, 
So self-examination is a, an important uh, aspect of our walk with the Lord because we assess where we're at, you know. Um, we don't take for granted our salvation. Oh, I'm saved, you know. I'm not going to worry about it. You know, I'm just live my life and, you know. <laughs> but it's like, despite the work of Christ in us, we're like a, an unopened flower, you know. And... Um, <clears throat> And only by allowing the light to, to kind of like a morning glory, you know, they bloom in the morning, you know, when the sunlight first hits them, you know, we're like that, you know, when the light of his word uh, contacts our heart, <laughs> you know, uh, we open up more and more, you know, we may not be open, you know, just because Lazarus is resurrected from the dead doesn't mean that he's not bound in grave clothes and needs to be loosed. <laughs> So uh, we need that kind of unraveling of the old man and of the old ways of thinking and all of that. And, and a lot of this takes self-examination in the light of God's revelation. You know, we're, we're not left to our own devices uh, in that sense. It's not that, uh, you know, we're doing this guessing game, oh, I'm a pretty good person, you know, Every person is right in their own eyes, the Bible says. You know, we can each of us list off all the good things and qualities that we have and all the things that we've done and, you know, kind of feel pretty good about ourselves. But, you know, God knows the truth. I mean, when you realize that, you know, when Jesus appeared to the Apostle John, he fell down as a dead man, even though he was an apostle of the Lord. And he had walked with Jesus uh, bodily when he was on the earth. And likewise, the prophet Daniel <laughs> fell down as a dead man when he encountered uh, the pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ. And so you have these uh, godly men who uh, one could dare say uh, you know, were far more advanced spiritually than you and I. Um, falling down as dead men when exposed <laughs> before God, when, when, when encountering God in a bodily presence um, or in a, 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 an appearance of, you know, when God just, boom. Uh, what does Daniel say? <clears throat> you know, he, he says, you know, woe is me. Isaiah, we have Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. When he's in heaven and he sees the Lord in his glory, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And so there you have it. So self-examination must be done in his light, and, um, and God will reveal you know, what needs to be judged. But that's uh, the, the second judgment. The third judgment that we want to discuss is the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment is specifically uh, related to the church. <clears throat> it is a judgment of the church. And by church, I don't mean a denomination. I don't mean an institution of man. I mean the ecclesia, as said in the Greek, the called out ones, those of us who are believers, where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus says, there am I in the midst of them. You have two believers together, behold the body of Christ. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and so the judgment seat of Christ is, an, is uh, something that we wish to cite the scriptures on. Uh, in Romans 14 and 10, okay, not in the Old Testament, Romans chapter 14, and verse 10 <clears throat> states, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And this word in the, um, in the Greek is bima, for judgment seat. Uh, we see it as two words in the English, but in Greek it's really one word, bima, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. And um, 
it's like a tribunal. It's like a, you know, a, a seat of, but one thing we know is that it's not set for judgment of sins. What we're going to see is that it's a judgment of works. You know, that's what the Lord is concerned with at this particular judgment. And this judgment occurs at the rapture of the church, at the resurrection, the first resurrection. Um, let me go into that a little bit, because what we need to address is the uh, mistaken notion that there's one resurrection, you know, and that good and bad are resurrected together. Uh, and that's a classical way of looking at it, but it's not biblical, nor is it uh, accurate. Um, we see in John chapter 5 <clears throat> that there are two judgments and two res And Revelation bears this out too. You know, what I'm going to cite here in John 5 is also, again, uh, mentioned in Revelations. Uh, it's portrayed. In, it's, you know, there's a first resurrection and then there's a second death. You know, there's a great resurrection. Those who, the first resurrection begins prior to Daniel's 70th week, you know, in Daniel 9, 27, where the seven-year tribulation is revealed, okay? Uh, biblically, it's known as Daniel's 70th week, okay? And um, it's a week of years, so seven years, and... Um, the first resurrection begins just prior to that, um, and that's not what this video is about, you know, pre-tribulation rapture, but that's what we're discussing. The first resurrection, the rapture is the first resurrection, the beginning of it, and it happens incrementally. Um, <clears throat> there's one that occurs before the first uh, seven years begins, the first of the seven years begins, one in the middle of it. Um, not to satisfy the mid-tribbers, <laughs> but uh, it involves the nation of Israel. Okay, Daniel chapter 12 discusses this, and so on. And then you have one at, uh, at the end, uh, just prior to the millennial reign of Christ, and you have one kind of at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. So between the seven years prior to the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, and at the end of the millennial reign of Christ is the first resurrection. You know, that, that whole time period is considered biblically as the first resurrection. And then there are some other events that take place you can read about in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, and then it's followed by this renovation of the earth and heavens by fire, where God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And meanwhile, somewhere in there, the great white throne judgment occurs. And that is when the the rest of the dead, as the Bible uh, speaks of it, and we're going to read that scripture uh, when we get there, but the rest of the dead live not until, you know, after the thousand years. Okay, so uh, then that's um, the resurrection of, of the dead. Uh, and so an entirely different resurrection. So we read here in John chapter 5, Verses 28 through 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life. Okay? And they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation, or condemnation, or judgment, in the Greek there. So, he would not have used the word resurrection twice to, 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 uh, to divide these two events, if it were not so. Um, he would have simply said, you know, all that are in the graves are going to hear his voice at one time, and they're going to rise to the resurrection. The good will be on the right side, the bad will be on the left. You know, he didn't say that here. He says that those who have done good will be a part of this resurrection, called the resurrection of life, and they that have not done well, they that have, uh, how does it say, have done evil, <laughs> shall 
resurrect the shall be a part of the resurrection of judgment, the resurrection of condemnation. You know, uh, so it's going to be two different uh, resurrections and hence two different judgments as well. So right now we're discussing the judgment seat of Christ. So they're going to be a part of this resurrection of life and the first resurrection. Okay, they're the first fruits of this first resurrection. Christ, the first fruits, includes the church, hence the pluralization of fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, we won't go into that right now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but note in Psalms chapter 1, um, this isn't in my notes, but I think it's important because, because of the notion that you know we're all going to be judged at the same time, the good with the bad. Um, but we need to be aware of what David says here in Psalms chapter 1. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 5. <clears throat> Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Who are the righteous? You know, we are made right by the blood of Jesus, by faith in what he did for us on the cross. You know, we were made right by him through his act, through Christ's faith, and we have come to believe in that faith. We have come to believe uh, in the righteousness that he has uh, given to us, you know. And so we are the righteous. And it's not because we're better or anything like that. It's just a, a different class of people. It's, the, it's one people, but it's divided by simply whether we believe or not. <laughs> It's div that's the division right there. You know, um, I did a video that you can find in uh, amongst my other videos, All Are Righteous. Okay, and there we discuss uh, how Paul uh, dis uh, reveals this in uh, Romans chapter 3, I believe. You know, and, you know, it's, it's like, a, you know, how it words it in Timothy, 1 Timothy, I believe, that, um, that Christ is the Savior of all men especially of they who believe. <laughs> That's the wording. You know, yeah, he is the savior of all men, but especially of they who believe. So all mankind, you know, we're going to get into this deeper, but all mankind are considered righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross, by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, um, God does not um, consider us, consider our sins, you know, in that sense, um, uh, as Second uh, Corinthians chapter five states, but one must believe into this. You know, when the Bible tells us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the actual Greek means that we are to believe into Christ. We are to believe into His promises. So we believe into what is true including what is true of us because of what Christ did for us, quite without our permission, quite without our participation, uh, and definitely quite apart from our deserving it. <laughs> okay, that's grace. That's the definition of grace, is unmerited favor. So, but the unrighteous or the ungodly, as it states here, uh, shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They just won't be a part of it. And the parable of the of the man with the without the wedding garment comes to mind uh, that Christ discusses in Matthew that you know in, in Eastern culture each guest is given um, a wedding garment that they have to put on to be a part of the wedding. And there's a man there who quite simply has refused this wedding garment, and he's sitting there in his own clothes, i.e. in his own righteousness, which Isaiah says is as filthy rags, 
Uh, and he's sitting there expecting to be accepted. But he rejected the, the wedding garment that's offered to the wedding guests. So he's <laughs> kicked out of the wedding because sinners will not be in the congregation of the righteous. The ungodly will not be there. So there's that. Uh, and that's the judgment seat of Christ. Only believers are going to be there. And um, what's going to happen? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What kind of judgment is this? A lot of Christians get paranoid that, that they're going to lose their salvation at that time. And, and I'm not at all wishing to imply that, that, um, that we're just going to take for granted the fact that we're there. I'm not, I mean, there's going to be an ontological shock, <laughs> you know, at seeing Christ. I mean, you know, we're going to be in our glorified bodies, granted. We're going to be like him, the Bible says, for we shall see him as he is, granted. And we're going to have a total different mind, the mind of Christ. You know, we're going to be who we are, you know, uh, the person that God uh, foreknew us to be. You know, we're going to be that person, you know. Um, but but there's going to be a holy awe there, you know. Um, you know, <clears throat> keep in mind the different heavenly scenes discussed uh, in the book of Revelations, chapter 4 and, verse, and chapter 5. For example, when <laughs> these heavenly beings, you know, the cherubim included, are falling down on their faces before God. So, you know, I mean... You know, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, one of the seven spirits of God, is definitely in heaven. And uh, we will be <laughs> filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of his manifestations is as the spirit of the fear of, of the Lord. So there's going to be a holy trembling there, I'm sure. But let's go ahead and read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Okay, <clears throat> for every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Whatever survives this fire, right? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Um, what is this fire? Okay. Um, I will say that it is not hell. <laughs> this fire is not hell. But I will say that, you know, my, my belief on that is that it is the eyes of Christ, which in Revelation chapter 1 are depicted as an uh, as the eyes of fire. You know, that Christ has eyes of fire. And uh, we remember that John fell as a dead man before Christ, <laughs> the resurrected Christ, when he encountered him on the island of Patmos. Um, and we know that Hebrews says that our God is as a consuming fire. You know, God is, our God is a consuming fire. So God is going to, you know, Christ, this is a judgment seat of Christ. He's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. He's going to try it with his eyes. Uh, there's scriptures in Psalms, uh, Proverbs, uh, that depict that a king scatters away evil with his eyes. You know, if you've had like a, a there's a lot of bosses out there nowadays, you know, and not hardly very many leaders, it seems to me. <laughs> but, you know, if you've had someone who you respected as a leader before you, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe, you know, maybe you're slacking at work or maybe you're, um, you know, uh, a little on the lazy side or maybe, you know, you're a little groggy that day and, and you know and the boss's eyes catch yours you're kind of kind of a little frazzled you're a little skittish maybe a little 
oh, you know, the boss just saw me, oh, I better make sure I do, you know, there's that sense there, <laughs> you know, a king scatters away evil with his eyes. It's in that sense that I believe that every man's works shall be tried by fire, every believer's works, <clears throat> and uh, there's uh, different types of works that we produce for the Lord, uh, of what sort it is, you know, there's wood, hay, and stubble. And none of that matters as to what is what, which is which, <laughs> as it all burns up when before Christ, okay? Um, and we suffer loss, yet we ourselves are saved, so it's not a question of salvation. It's a question of where do we serve Christ during the millennium reign of Christ? When he reigns on the earth for a thousand years, he is king of kings and lord of lords, and we are kings and lords under him. You know, the Bible discusses um, that uh, this person receives X amount of cities, you know, 10 cities. Another person receives five cities. Another person uh, receives one city. And, and there's ge geographical rewards, if you will, um, dominion, various uh, degrees of dominion were given. There's crowns the Bible discusses. Uh, so there's different kinds of rewards that the Bible discusses, but he himself shall suffer, he himself shall be saved, yes, so as by fire, but he suffers loss, you know. And, and um, then there's also other types of works that make it through the fire, and these are going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. That's how uh, these works are described. <coughs> Jesus said um, in Matthew chapter 6, Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. Okay, so through our good works, we're able to lay up treasures in heaven, if our motives are pure, because there are those who do works for to be seen of men. Matthew 6 discusses again, and uh, others see it, and they're like, they applaud it. Wow. You helped that old lady across the street. Good on you, man. You know, and and it was timed just right so the elders of the church would see you do it. Uh, that's a, a work of the flesh. <laughs> Those types of things that we do for the praise of men or out of fear of man. Uh, none of those things are going to survive. Or we do things to make a name for ourselves or to build our own kingdom. None of those things survive the eyes of Christ. Uh, and he alone knows the secrets of the heart. Uh, and so we all stand before that judgment seat. Let's go on. <clears throat> that's a, so that's a pretty important judgment to talk about. So I'm glad we went through that. Next is the judgment seat of the Gentile nations, which take place, you know, first the rapture occurs, right? And while the seven years are unfolding on the earth, the seven-year tribulation um, is unfolding, we have the judgment of the Gentile nations after the fact, when Christ bodily returns to the earth, uh, as in Revelation 19, as in the book of Jude, with all his saints and all the, the or angels, <laughs> hosts, the heavenly hosts are going to come with him. And uh, he sets up his thousand-year reign. Part of that is he's promised to break the nations of the earth with a rod of iron, uh, as clay pots are broken up. You know, he's going to, you know, establish his reign on the earth. And... Um, you know, how do we portray that? Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a judgment. <laughs> and um, part of this judgment is a time of accountability where the nations are gathered together before him. And I'll go ahead and read um, this text out of Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 35, through 33. So Matthew 25, 31 through 33. When the Son of Man shall come in the glory, in his glory, 
the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And the Greek word there is ethnos. So that's a Greek word for the nations, the Gentile nations of the world. Uh, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Okay. And then this is where he goes into it and he says, you know, to the ones on the right, I was hungry and you fed me, naked and you clothed me, in prison or sick and you visited me. Uh, you know, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You know, but they ask him, when did you, when did we see you uh, in these conditions? And he answers them and says, um, as in verse 40 of Matthew 25, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now when he says unto the least of these my brethren, we have to understand what Jesus is talking about. We have to understand where we are. Being in the book of Matthew, Matthew, which was, according to the, uh, the uh, first church historian Eusebius uh, of the fourth century, he, he spoke and said that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. And, and it's kind of divided up like uh, in five sections like the Torah. And it's very, it feels like the Torah, <laughs> you know, uh, if you're familiar with the Torah. And, you know, the later copies we have are in Greek, but um, the original was in Hebrew. And what we have now are Greek copies of that original Hebrew uh, text, uh, original Hebrew gospel. And everything about Matthew is, is pointed toward, it, it applies to us Gentiles, you know, uh, certainly, I get a lot out of it, <laughs> uh, and it does involve us definitely. But its main focus is on the Jewish people believing in uh, Yeshua as their Messiah. You know, and so when he says, "Whatsoever you have done," when he says to the Gentile nations, "Whatsoever you have done unto the least of these my brethren," he is referring to uh, the Jews as his brethren. You know, he himself being of the tribe of Judah. And so, praise God, <laughs> uh, the Gentile nations will be judged based on their treatment of the Jewish people and of Israel. And so, <laughs> that will render a nation a goat nation or a sheep nation. And, um, and so we have, uh, you know, this is based on the the Abrahamic promise, the Abrahamic covenant uh, being still in effect, and the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled during this time, you know, brought to its nth letter during this time. Uh, so Israel will amass a lot of land at that time, uh, speaking that prophetically, not in, in any kind of political sense. Um, and so... He says, I will bless those who bless thee, and I will curse those. I will curse him who curses thee, uh, God says to Abraham. So <clears throat> that's a manifestation of this, okay? So let's leave that now, that, that uh, judgment. So we've gone through four judgments now. Judgment of sin at the cross, number one. Believer's self-judgment, number two. Judgment seat of Christ, third judgment. Fourth, we have the judgment of the Gentile nations. Fifth, we have the judgment of Israel. And that's discussed in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, when Christ promises to the twelve apostles uh, that they shall sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, that's going to also occur during the same time period, <laughs> uh, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. Number six, we have the judgment of angels. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3, and Jude verse 6, okay? These concern the angels that sinned with women, as discussed in Genesis chapter 6, uh, which uh, came about, uh, the angels saw the daughter of daughters of men as fair, and they, you know, copulated with them, and giants came about in those days, men of renown, and a lot of the mythologies of the world, uh, from Navajo mythology to Greek mythology uh, to Norse mythology, all over the world, uh, hints back at this Atlantean age <laughs> uh, where giants reigned and, and magic was in the air and everything was so peachy keen. Not, <laughs> because what was happening was the human form was being altered Hmm, sound familiar? Uh, angels were breeding with humans, and uh, there's this hybrid creature uh, was uh, walking the earth in those days, and God <laughs> had to destroy everything with a flood because things became, became so corrupt and violent and sinful. And so, <clears throat> but the angels that fell during that time, which kept not their first estate, as the Bible says, are currently held in chains of darkness in this uh, Greek hell called Tartarus. And um, we are going to be the ones, <laughs> yes, you and I, the church, will be the ones judging these angels. Um, Paul says, uh, you can't ha handle the smallest matters amongst yourselves, uh, that you have to go to lawyers out in the world, unbelievers, judging believers. You know, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? So that's uh, the sixth judgment discussed now is the judgment of angels. Finally, the seventh judgment involves the judgment of the dead. And I used to say the judgment of the wicked dead. The accuracy of that uh, is probably more true than not. Um, because we don't really want to, as believers, be a part of this judgment. But I want to say that being a part of this judgment um, may be, you know, how I discussed at the beginning of this video, you know, most people view, um, they have in mind one judgment, you know, that all mankind stands in mass before God at the last day, and he judges the good from the bad. <clears throat> that has a, a sense of truth to it, a, uh, that has uh, that, a touch of truth to it, because what's present at this judgment is, let's just read it. Let's go to Revelation 20, uh, verses 4 through 15. Remember, this is a different resurrection now. The first resurrection is over. The thousand-year reign of Christ uh, has ended, and and so whoever you know made uh, the right choices and died during that millennial reign of Christ are part of that first resurrection at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. So you know, got to give us give ourselves proper perspective here, proper context, right? So let's go to Revelation twenty. And so this is going to be the resurrection of damnation that Christ mentioned in uh, John chapter 5, or the resurrection of judgment or condemnation. So Revelation 20, verses 4 through 15. <clears throat> and we begin. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Oh, this will give us a little context, so we'll go ahead and start at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, they being the righteous. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, 
upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. See, so you can see how Alpha and Omega, at the beginning of the millennial reign, and really seven years before that, the first resurrection begins with the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, believers in Christ, the dead and the living at that time. From all history, <laughs> since the church began, will be resurrected at that time. And uh, so that's what kicks off this cataclysmic seven years. I mean, what a shocker that's going to be, right? So from there, Alpha and Omega, to the end of the millennial reign of Christ is considered the first resurrection. Okay, happening in increments. Okay, now the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, which we learn is the lake of fire, hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, during that millennium. Okay. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay. And uh, he deceives the nations again, verse 8. Um, and they attack the, the saints of God, verse 9. So this is, this is another, like, Re mini rebellion. We don't know a lot about what's going to happen here. This is after the millennial reign of Christ, but but people are given another chance to make a choice for Christ or not. Or they're going to side with uh, Satan and his minions again, who who are now released from from their place. And so. Um, So God, God wins this final battle. We don't know how long this is all going to take. Okay, it could be centuries. It could be within a decade. We don't know. <laughs> so that's a mystery there. But uh, verse 10, after God defeats these uh, uh, enemies, okay, it says, uh, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, you could say still are, <laughs> And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, <clears throat> from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And, the, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so this is the great white throne judgment. And the interesting thing about this judgment is that, you know, this occurs long after the church has been judged, long after a lot of these other judgments took place. And... What's present at this judgment is the Lamb's Book of Life, and it's actually searched. I mean, if it was a done deal, and it was just a given that this is the wicked dead, you know, okay, we're going to just judge you, you know, according to your works, and, you know, works being according to knowledge, you know, uh, you know, you can consider Luke chapter 19 and verses... Um, I'm sorry, uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 31 through 32, um, that people are judged according to the knowledge that they have. The degree and severity of judgment is according to um, 
the knowledge one has, the light one has been given. This is going to factor in for us uh, when we discuss the final things we want to get into. But um, <clears throat> the books being opened, you know, for works and, and knowledge and 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 uh, the book of life, the, the Lamb's book of life is there, and it's actually searched. What a moot point if if everyone if it's a given that they're all just wicked and and let's just judge them according to the severity of their sins, the severity of their crimes, uh, according to the light that they have, and be done with it, you know. Um, and by severity, the intensity of judgment, you know, uh, will be accordingly. Um, but these judgments. Um, these hellish judgments are remedial rather than final. This is not a finality. Okay. So we we want to be clear on that, but I can only be clear so far in this video because our topic is the different types of judgment. But uh, you know this is going to work perfectly because we're gonna we're going to go right into uh, what I stated at the beginning of the video that that uh, Christ does something with judgment here in chapters 5 and, and chapters 12 of the Gospel of John. So we're going to go there. But I want to say, you know, notice, <laughs> I want to point out, I want to highlight that the Lamb's Book of Life is present at this judgment of the dead. Yes, they are dead. Yes, they are a part of this resurrection of damnation, as the good old King James calls it. This, this uh, resurrection of condemnation, or this resurrection of judgment, as the Greeks uh, states. So, and, and none of us want to be there, okay? Even if the Lamb's Book of Life is going to be there, I... You know, I want to be in the Lamb's Book of Life, and, and, we, and we are. But uh, I, you know, even if I was confident that my name was in that book, I don't want to be at this judgment. <laughs> you know, uh, I, they're not going to be standing in glorified bodies. I, I don't know what the state of their physical bodies will be about. Uh, I've had different opinions about this down through the years that uh, are more speculative than anything, so they will not be voiced here. But we can at least say they're going to be in their physical bodies, okay? And, but we also know that the Lamb's Book of Life is going to be searched. And whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the hell you know, we know of in the Greek as Gehenna, the one Jesus preached about. Uh, he also mentions Hades, but... <clears throat> He's referring to Isaiah chapter 66, you know, that discusses that hell. And, you know, and, the, but, but we can also say contrary wise, that whosoever was found in the Lamb's book of life shall not be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Um, John goes by way of the negative, you know, and that's his prerogative. That's what he saw in his vision on the island of Patmos, and um, and it's going to have that overall sense to it, that judgment is going to be overall um, opposite to, because remember, Jesus said that those who have done evil shall be at this judgment. You know, this is the judgment that the unbeliever, this is the judgment that the um, the ungodly, as Psalms chapter 1 I'm, I have in mind, is referring to, okay? So at this point, having discussed the seven judgments, uh, I want to briefly go through what Jesus does with judgment itself. Okay, now this will be said, my coffee is cold, so that means this video is going to be a long one. Okay, uh, and I won't have too much time to go as deep into it as I may have in my first video, the one where I lost the sound to. But um, we'll just see where the Lord takes this. <clears throat> now what I'm about to say, what I'm about to share, out of John chapter 5 and John chapter 12, <clears throat> doesn't undo everything that we've set up to this point. 
what it does is it, it takes it to another level. It takes it to maybe the heart of God concerning judgment itself. Because what we learn, and you can really see this through the parables of Jesus, um, all the different parables, Jesus is getting at something, and we don't have any time to go into it, only to refer to it, only to hint at it right now. But is the heart of God concerning humanity, and, and also a slam and a rebuke toward the judgmental, those who want to see their enemies judged, those who can hardly wait till till uh, God starts judging folk. You know, those people are out there, and we sh we we shouldn't be surprised. There's the censorous, there's the the self righteous, and the holier than thou who just salivate uh, at the prospect of their enemies uh, being judged. You know, them being vindicated and and right and righteous. And, and all the rest of humanity getting theirs. You know, yeah, you belong to this group. You believed that. You were a part of this. You did that. Now you're going to get yours. Um, remember, there was a town in Samaria that rejected the message that Christ came to bring them when he walked the earth with his disciples. And the brothers James and John... <laughs> John's the author of the gospel that I'm about to quote from. They were like, Lord, should we call down fire out of heaven as Elijah did to consume that town because they rejected your teaching? Jesus checked them and said, Ye know not what spirit you are of, for the Son of Man came not to judge men, but to save men's lives. You know, Jesus came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. You know, <clears throat> so let's go into it. John chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. For the Father judgeth no man. Just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. <clears throat> Jesus just took judgment out of the Father's hands and placed it in his own hands. Okay. I always imagined that it was the Father sitting on the great white throne judgment, you know, with all the masses of of dead humanity standing before him, okay? Uh, those who are part of that judgment, that resurrection of damnation. I pictured that it was the Father sitting on that throne. But what happens is that Jesus just took judgment out of the Father's hands and placed it in his own. The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that we would honor the Son even as we honor the Father, okay? Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We believe in a trinity, you know, that God is one, and uh, he has three personalities, as it were. He has three expressions of personhood, okay? Um, and the Son needs to be seen in his divinity, you know, uh, simply put. So he, but let's, let's see what happens here. Okay, let's go to John chapter 12, verses 31 through 33. There's a... Um, glory, just open right up to it. <laughs> There's a, a gradual revelation of judgment going on here that we need to pay close attention to in John 5 and 12, okay? So in John 12... Verses 31 through 33, we read, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 
or as it literally says, I will draw all unto me. Min is in italics there. So, <clears throat> he reveals something about the cross that is universal and that is present truth, present tense, at the time he spoke this. And he says, now is the judgment of the cosmos. You know, the world is coming under judgment right now. In fact, you know, how far reaching is this? You know, does this involve humanity? Does this involve also angels and demons and, and uh, spiritual entities? You know, yeah, because he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, which we know is the devil, shall be cast out. And then he says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will begin to, I will draw all unto me. I will draw all men unto me. So, <laughs> what he starts here at the cross, first he takes judgment out of the Father's hands and places it into his own, the Son. I'm going to judge everyone, okay? Then he takes judgment itself out of the hands of the various epochs of time that we discussed in the seven different judgments that we listed. And he places it all at one central moment in time, the crucifixion. When he was crucified, all judgments take place at that time. Now this doesn't undo everything we just said in the beginning, in the uh, first part of this video, but what it does is it centralizes all judgments to the cross, to Christ. First, he, he took judgment out of the Father's hands, and he, play, and he centralized all judgment unto the Son, unto himself. So we have Christ-centered judgment. All judgments are a Christ-centered judgment. Then, he took all judgments happening over this vast space of time, you know, a uh, great amount of time that we're talking about here. Um, and he places it into one event, one place in time, the cross of Christ, the crucifixion. Now is the judgment of the cosmos. Now is the prince of this world cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me. We, we tend to look at Revelation 20 being the last book in the Bible and being third to the last chapter in the Bible <laughs> as the final word on judgment. Okay, you know, the white throne judgment is going to happen and that about does it. That settles it. That's the exclamation point of the Bible is God's judgment of the wicked. Is it? Is it? Jesus just change things up. Jesus just recalibrated the whole concept of judgment onto a Christ-centered and onto a cross-centered judgment. So the cross trumps the great white throne judgment. <laughs> Glory, this is powerful. <laughs> I'm banging my desk here. Uh, because he says that I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me. The self-righteous are not going to see this. Um, maybe those who just want to hold on to their dogma don't want to see this. <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm not stating dogmatically here that all are going to be saved, but this is pretty darn hopeful if I ever saw it <laughs> for for humanity, because what we do see and and you know where do you settle with your heart on this? You know, we can see this in a linear fashion. You know, John authored both books. You know, according to strong church tradition, the Apostle John authored both books, the Gospel of John and Revelation. Five books in total in the Bible. But So what is being said here? What is being gotten at? You know, what is being gotten at here? You know, that, that now is the judgment of the cosmos. The prince of the world's cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me. Okay, so there's this eternal drawing 
or however long it takes, <laughs> this drawing upon humanity, upon each individual heart. Let's say we're talking about the wicked dead. You know, let's say we're talking about those who are cast into the lake of fire because their names were not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. There's a drawing upon them. They they are part of this all. That that you know, when if Christ be lifted up from the earth, he will draw all unto him. They too are part of this all, or else words don't mean anything. Or unless all doesn't mean all. Brother, what does all mean? All. <laughs> okay, so let's go on from there into this uh, verse, just a few verses down to verses 47 through 48. <clears throat> and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. What? <laughs> For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. <clears throat> so let's look at this, uh, this progressive revelation, this gradual revelation unfolding before us right now. Chapter 5, Jesus takes judgment out of the Father's hands and places it in his own. Then he takes judgment from these uh, divided epochs of time and focuses it on the cross. That, you know, he's going to be drawing all unto himself. That, he, that now is the, the cosmos judged. Then... He takes judgment out of his own hands. <laughs> he says, if anyone believes me not, I judge him not. Okay. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You know, there's a, there's a, a cry of disappointment out there. Because they're waiting for Jesus to, to take off the gloves and to really do some <laughs> judgment. You know. And now he's saying... I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. This is what I came to do. Okay. <clears throat> and he, he's talking about those who do not believe him and those who reject him. Okay. This is the gospel because, uh, you know, those who are present at the great white throne are those who did not believe Jesus. Those who rejected Jesus will be there at that great white throne judgment. We have established that. Okay? But he says, I don't judge them. So neither is the Son sitting on the throne, per se. Okay? There's mystery involved. I'm not saying, you know, that it's going to be a vacated throne or anything. I'm not saying that God's not going to judge anyone. I'm not saying things like that. You have to hear, you have to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. These things are now going into a realm, a metaphorical realm, where the one sitting on the throne is not even the Son. First it wasn't the Father anymore, now it's not the Son, but it's the words that Christ spoke. The same shall judge him in the last day. You know, uh, we see in the Gospel of John where it's written that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, um, <clears throat> this is the condemnation, Jesus says. You know, this is the condemnation. This is the judgment. That men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither came they to the light lest their deeds should be uh, reproved. You know, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, uh, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought or worked out in God. Okay, so this is the judgment. The words that I spoke shall judge him in the last day. So it's like C.S. Lewis said, you know, that, um, you know, he has found that unbelievers are the perfect rebels to the end. 
you know, and that really the, the doors of hell are, are shut from within. <laughs> you know, it's like one seals their own fate uh, by virtue of disbelieving the Logos that's been revealed to them, the light, the word that's been revealed to them insofar as it's been revealed, the degree of light they have, whether you're talking about someone who's been preached the gospel full on or someone who's caught glimpses of it in the different religions of the world. Light is sown for the righteous. You know, light uh, is trans is is spread everywhere. Uh, all of creation uh, points to the Creator. Um, we have the conscience within ourselves, which I've called a mini white throne judgment. You know, dividing between uh, accusing us or else excusing us, as Romans says. And so you have the words of Christ seated on that throne at the last day, you know, and, and if someone disbelieves, if someone rejects Christ, what they know of Christ, will the same will judge them in that day. And so what we have here is a glorious gospel that we don't know the full implications of, but we know this, that God intends fully to draw all unto himself. And my prayer this day is that we would see these things in a right spirit and in a right heart, which isn't to say that God is uh, pussyfooting around evil and that, you know, he's not going to judge evil. You know, we know God is righteous. We know God is just. We know that the judge of all the earth will do what is right. Okay. But we also know that he's always against this self-righteous uh, spirit that, that salivates uh, waiting for judgment to fall on others. It's that spirit that, that is odious to God, you know, because he came not to judge. He came to save the world. And, and it is my belief that he, you know, accomplished, you know, when he said at the cross, it is finished, that was a triumphant cry right there. And so I just leave you with that today, and I just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.